Welcome to our actual very first episode of Leadership Talk. Um, over the coming months, we'll be talking about a number of hot topics, starting this month with reimagining the workplace for the new season. Some people call it the new norm, but I rather call it the new season. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Celine, Celine Hogenkamp, uh, founder of Global Spirited Leadership. And with me is my colleague and good friend and co-host, Jordan Goldrich. Um, I met Jordan at a conference in San Diego um, for the Associate, um, Association of Corporate Executives. And I remember Jordan, I made this um, entry where I stumbled over a step. <laughs> I sort of landed into the, into the conference champagne hour and Jordan rushed up to me and he very gallantly gave me his hand and lifted me up and as if nothing happened. So we connected instantly. <laughs> Jordan is also um, a former CEO and recently the author of, Amer of the Amazon best-selling Workplace Warrior, People Skills for the No Bullshit Executive, or as I call it, the Abrasive Leader. Um, but I have to say, Jordan, it couldn't have been written by a better suited person than you. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for joining us today. I appreciate and, your acknowledging my abrasiveness. That's... <laughs> well, it's not there. Um, so with us, to I'm really, really thrilled and um, so grateful for this panel to have these three incredible guests, and they're all global human resource experts with it. I'm going to start with Kathleen Procario. Um, Kathleen is head of um, HR North America for Bacardi, and it's the largest privately owned spirits company in the world. So Kathleen, I'm going to ask, um, could you introduce yourself and your company? Sure, of course. Um, thank you, Celine. Um, yes, Kathleen Procario and I, um, I am the head of human resources for North America. Um, it's been a, a crazy few months here in HR and enjoying that, but um, I've, I've had a career mostly in the spirits industry. And as you mentioned, the party's the largest spirits and um, privately owned, owned spirits company. Um, and through that, I've had some wonderful experiences throughout the country, um, starting with Diageo in, in uh, Connecticut and um, working with Glazers and Southern Glazers, our distributor network, um, prior to coming to Picardi about two years ago. Um, but the, the organization itself is wonderful. Bacardi is a very family oriented um, culture and um, we have really leveraged that through a lot of this time and, and why I'm excited to be here a bit today. Um, Bacardi North America itself is, or Bacardi Limited is 7,000 employees okay. um, and Bacardi North America is 700 of that. So we are the largest region, um, but we have global dialogues about what's happening everywhere. Um, in, in terms of kind of the space and the topic today. So I'm looking forward to, to talking about it. Great, welcome. And then I'm moving on to Nicole, Nicole Barrow. Actually, before you move on, yeah. I just have to ask, is it true that people are drinking a lot more these days? <laughs> yeah, um, it is. Uh, it, it's been really interesting in, in the time of COVID and, and they say this about the spirits industry that in good times and in bad times, everybody drinks. So um, we have seen that, at least in our off-premise -prem channels, so our retailers, um, our sales have gone up significantly because people are drinking at home as opposed to the restaurants and bars that are closed right now. So we have a little bit of a challenge with our forecast and our mix, but um, no, we, we're doing well uh, at the moment. So thanks for asking, Jordan. <laughs> I was just I was just getting concerned that it was just my Dutch and Scottish background that had sort of started drinking more. Yeah, my, <laughs> my bottle of Bacardi is a lot lower than it was, even just Nicole a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to move on to Nicole. Nicole Barrow, she's head of HR customer solutions and innovations for the Americas region of Deutsche Post DHL Group. And it's another household name, right? So, Nicole, um, could you introduce yourself and the and DHL a bit more? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Celine. Hi, guys. Hi, Jordan. Um, pleasure to be with you today. So, I am Nicole Barrow. I'm the head of HR for uh, CSI, not CSI Miami, but uh, <laughs> Solutions and Innovation for Deutsche Post DHL. Yeah. 
Um, we are uh, the most international company in the world. We are the logistics company of the world. And like Bacardi, that's probably seeing some peaks. Uh, we certainly are seeing our peaks in the logistics company because we do connect people and improve lives. Yeah. And I've been busier than ever uh, yeah. during this time. Yeah. So globally, we have about half a, a little over half a million employees. So quite a large company. Um, my group, CSI, is quite a small group, uh, considering the scale of, of Deutsche Post DHL. CSI has about uh, almost 500 employees globally, and we are the central point of contact commercially for Deutsche Post DHL's largest customers. So the, the big guns come to us for their logistics needs, and we're that single point of contact. So it has been uh, tremendously interesting over the last few months. We are busier than ever. The, the yeah. work days seem <laughs> extraordinarily longer than ever. Yeah. Uh, and we're all mostly working from home uh, all over yeah. the world. So it's, it's pretty interesting how we've pivoted and, and still continue to move the, the world's packages uh, in, yeah. a, in a successful way. So happy yeah. to be here though. Yeah, I can imagine, Nicole, that especially with you managing all the bigger bigger accounts that they've become very focused on how they're going to get their business moving and keep it moving. So it must be a stressful time for you. For sure. You've got to come up with solutions really quickly. That's exactly right. It's, it's a change of how we do business, but it's one of the benefits of COVID, if there ever has been one, was that we've been busier than ever. I mean, really, really trying to do whatever we can in any way we can to support our customers and help their businesses uh, continue. And, so, and, and great for your people to step up to the challenge. And they have. It's, yeah. it's been extraordinary. It's been extraordinary. Well, thank you. Good to have you. Um, and finally, it's uh, Kathleen Halligan. She just jumped in yesterday because one of our other panel members had an emergency and could be there. So... Very grateful, Kathleen, that you so brave and jumped in and just see where this is going to take us, this conversation. So to introduce Kathleen, she's a chartered psychologist in people performance, which is a leading HR firm in Ireland, serving global customers and clients such as, you know, ASL Aviation Group, which is headquartered in Dublin. And Kathleen currently is working on their account. So Kathleen, could you introduce yourself and, and what you do? Sure, yeah. Uh, so delighted uh, to be along, as, as all the others say as well. So I am a work and organisation psychologist and people performance. We are a, a, a group of psychologists who focus on the psychology of people in the workplace. And we've all come from strong industry backgrounds. So we've all worked in different industries earlier in our career. So we bring that to our consulting now to support those organizations that we worked with in the past. So we focus on the whole area of organization design and development, uh, which is very topical at the moment, obviously, in, in our current circumstance. We also look at executive leadership development and business and executive coaching. Um, but in terms of the, you know, the current COVID uh, situation and, and as you even say, you know, the broader climate that we find ourselves in at the moment with all the disruption that's been going on globally. Uh, we're working very closely with organizations to look at what is the learning that we can take from what has been sort of imposed on us right now that we can bring into reimagining the new season, uh, as you call it, rather than, than the new normal. So, uh, yeah, so th th that very much has been our focus. So in that the, we continue to work with our clients on the projects that we were working with them, but we're through that, we're helping them through the changes that they're going through right now as well. Mm. So exciting and challenging time. So let's kick off the conversation um, to get this flowing. We're all going to, um, well, since all of us are jumping in for the first time, we decided let's have an organic conversation, see where it takes us. And um, I like to kick it off by actually acknowledging that for most of 2020, this has been an incredibly disruptive season. And um, I don't know about you, but I think the human psyche has had a lot to endure with, a lot of to endure on their brain, you know, each individually and as, and as collectively. It's not only 
been the global pandemic, but it's been wildfires, it's been social, political unrest, you know, hurricanes, it's been a lot. It's, it's a disruptive, crazy, unsettling year so far. And, and, uh, and it keeps shifting, you know, that you think you have arrived and then this, the rug is pulled again, it shifts again. And so, so at times like this, I was thinking, you know, and I'm sure a lot of you do, that it's time to hit the brakes and um, stop and reflect and pause. And, you know, before we jump into the new, to see is actually what the old has surfaced us, what can we take forward? What is the new going to look like? And get a fresh perspective before we actually jump into action. And um, I'm going to ask um, our panel, that's how we start off the conversation, what this fresh perspective could look like and what we've learned um, and how your company actually has been affected by this. So give us a story about what it's all looking like, what, it's, what is it feeling like, what are people saying, what are people doing? So Kathleen, um, Bacardi, Procario, Procario, do you like to start off? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I, I, we've actually, we've been thinking about this a lot uh, because we are about to open our offices um, next week. But during this time, you know, when I think back to March when we went home, um, it's been a bit of a, a journey. Um, you know, first with everybody being sent home and, you know, we all thought we were just going home for two weeks maybe. Um, when we, when I went back to do a walkthrough, you know, people had left fruit, like an apple on their desk, like not realizing they wouldn't come, be coming back. Um, and so one of the things that we did early on was, again, yeah, I mentioned earlier, our culture very much is about family. And so we, we look to put our people first. Um, and in a lot of our communications talked about that, um, putting our primos, actually, we, we refer to our employees as primos who are cousins uh, in Spanish. And, um, and we, um, in doing that, you know, we, we've really been keeping people front and center, um, particularly with the empathetic leader, right? You, you, you want to make sure that we continue to do that. And I would say around May, if you think about all the different milestones, it became clear to us that, you know, mental health was um, something to be considered and talked about um, and continue to be talked about. And so we do, through our programming, we have been keeping a lens on that. Um, but, you know, when you talk about what it looks like or what it's going to look like. The dialogue we've been having has actually been termed globally, um, we're calling it the new better, right? So we, we have looked to, um, to change our office spaces a little bit, right? We've, um, we, we'll be in more of a reduced capacity. We, we recognize that across the, the US in particular and across the globe that there are different needs. It's gonna be at different times not knowing um, what's gonna happen with COVID and, um, you know, waiting for vaccines. And so um, we've leaned in technology so that we have booking, sy uh, booking systems, for example, to book your desk. Um, there was a whole clean out wow. where people no longer have dedicated space. Um, so we're, we're starting to think about what the new office looks like. Um, we generally, because we're a spirits company, we do have kind of a, a more collaborative space. We have a bar in, in most of our offices. Um, we have... Uh, Right, we have um, kind of more collaborative office um, conference rooms, you know, with sofas and, and art kind of around. And um, so we have a little bit of that flair already, but as we kind of test things out and, and move slowly through this change, um, like I said, it'll, it'll be kind of more of a hybrid environment for now. So the working from home is working. We're productive. We're, we're getting it done. Um, we have concerns about burnout, right, the, the mental health pieces of things, um, or just wellness in general. But, um, you know, the new better and that new vision is embracing it and um, looking to see what great things come out of it um, while keeping our culture front and center, right? That's probably the hardest part of this dialogue is culture. How do you keep culture when you're not all together? And we are having active conversations every day looking for activities to bring us together when we can't actually <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, um, I like when you say that all the, all the primos have sort of pulled together and you're creating the new better. And so I'm wondering what is consistent in what you're doing? Is it, um, is there transparency? Is it, what is, what is your message in this? Yeah, I, I definitely say we've leaned into transparency. Not that we haven't been transparent in the past, but 
Um, the leadership team is not afraid to say, I don't know, or we don't know yet. Um, we're still figuring it out. I think that's been a key piece. And, you know, obviously we all know from dealing with people that change is sometimes not easy. Um, and so it's additional, you know, we're doing a lot more conversations and, and communications about it. Um, but yeah, for sure, we're being very transparent with everyone. All right. Does anybody want to weigh in? What are they doing? <clears throat> I love the topic of the new better. Um, yeah. It's a very a, way, a good way to keep it on a positive front because seven months into this, it's it's a long time, and and seeing no no end in in the near future is is challenging. So yeah. that's a that's a nice phrase I might borrow. The new yeah. better, I like that. We'll, we'll credit our marketing team communication. <laughs> I'm just on a on a somewhat lighter note. I'm just wondering whether or not you have bars in your offices in the United States. We do. Our, our Coral Gables office has a bar on the 15th floor. Oh my gosh. As a, as a former employee assistance program director, almost all the companies we knew eliminated that just because of the uh, exposure threat. <laughs> yeah, it's very common in our industry. Ah, okay. Uh, I remember the first time I walked into the Bacardi office in Australia in Sydney, I, the, the, you expect the normal foyer, I was bowled over. It was an amazing glam bar. Um, and so my question was, how are you going to stop people, you know, drinking before five or six o'clock? And they said, well, that's, that's, that's our culture. I mean, that, this is our product. Clients come in. This is what we have. And they're so proud of it. It was really, really good to see. Yeah, so we, it's um, helped us to win a, a couple of awards, actually, for like best office space because it's so unusual, right? But no, your average person is not drinking during the day, I promise. Don't worry, George. <laughs> so, Nicole, Nicole, you and I were talking before that you just starting this conversation with DHL about going back. So where are you fitting in this chain of activities and what is it looking like? So it's really interesting, right? Globally, we the, the way of model through this uh, and it's really learning as we go has been constant communication and really listening to employees and really trying to keep up with the, the the national and governmental guidelines but also really taking cues from our from our employees so just timing being perfect I just had a, a, a call this morning about the future of work with all of the heads of HR for the region here in this in, in the Americas maybe uh, I think it was at nine o'clock this morning, Eastern time. And um, interesting discussion. I thought, boy, you know, going into this call, what, a, what an appropriate time. But we've, we've remained open for the most part in this office. Uh, I'm in the regional office in Plantation, Florida. And the office has been open and timed with the state openings. Right now, the state has moved to phase three. Um, and our office was still on phase okay. one. So it's still been very voluntary. Uh, and we were at 20% capacity for a while, up to 20%. And I guarantee we never had 20%. So now we've moved uh, with, with phase three of Florida reopening. We have now, <clears throat> today, we'll announce next week, that we will move to phase two for, for our employees. Still voluntary, but up to 50%. And it's interesting. So I mentioned earlier, you look at the backdrop. I'm actually in the regional office. I, I came back maybe two months ago. I was, I was fed up of working at home and, wow. and see. You know, needed yeah. some consistency to mentally connect. And it's interesting. I, I inter everybody's like, oh, aren't you afraid? I interact with very few people because most people still are not comfortable in coming back to the office. Um, they know that we have every guideline and every precaution taken, temperature checks, uh, sanitation stations everywhere. I mean, social distancing, we've done the whole gamut, but people are, they're still nervous. Uh, you have yeah. a, a picture of emotions, you have people with elder care or kids, you know, so it's, it's, it's working. I never would have thought, given our environment, that they would be so productive working from home. I mean, they pivoted overnight. We have customer service and direct operations in other groups and they, I don't even know how they did it within the span of two weeks operations were seamless. So they've been successful. Uh, the future of work is what's in question. What will the future look like in terms of these offices? Because right now we're probably still, I don't know, 20%, not even 20%, I would say 15, 15% of people coming into the office. So it definitely will be a, 
a different way of of moving logistics. Mm. I uh, thanks Nicole. I read an article the other day by Corn Ferry and. It surprised me, the question, the, the, the survey was about, I think they surveyed about a thousand professionals and the question was, um, do we really need to coax back people to the workplace? And, and it's staggering, I was surprised. 47% of people were saying, no, we're going to stay 2020, we're going to work from home. And I was very sad to read that. It's like, you know, the people I'm speaking with, most of my clients, and I have to say they are the younger age group at the moment, they are actually craving connection. And um, to, for, for me to read that, I'm, I'm surprised. So what, what are you thinking about this? The interesting thing is, I think in the beginning, people were very excited to work from home. <clears throat> it, it was the well, you don't know what's going on. But I think as time has dragged on and everybody's, and let me step back a second. We were earlier this year, before COVID, planning to redo our offices restructure, new carpets, new appearance, everything. And we kind of put it on hold. We are continuing to do that, which it was a surprise to me. And they said, well, no matter what we have to, we do want to update and refresh and stuff. So we continue with that. But what it will look like in the future, in, in, the, be in the beginning of the year, we wanted an open environment and open desks and shared spaces. And people came back and said, hey, not so sure about the completely open. We want shared space and collaborative space, but they, they want us to take uh, extra precautions. So they like the cube atmosphere, which was very probably considered passe now. Um, but you fast forward and you say, most people are gonna continue to work from home. Nobody wants to come back into the office, but I agree. They are craving connection. Every yeah. opportunity they have to have um, virtual social interaction, they, they, they leap and, and cling to that. So I think people definitely, for, at least for my, my group, they want the flexibility of, of being able to work from home, but they want an office space. So even they don't even like the shared space, like the pop-in, you can hot desk. They want their own space and maybe work from two days at home or three days at home and then in the office the rest of the week. Yeah. So it's interesting yeah. for us. Yeah. Kathleen H., I saw you raising your hand before. Oh yeah, now I was just going to come in on that, that some of the clients that we're working with were a little bit like you're saying there, Nicole, they've created the space for people to go back into the office and social distance and sanitize and sanitize the desk and all that. And, you know, they were asking the question as well, why aren't people coming in? And the employees who really, a bit like you're saying, uh, Celine, who want to get back in are saying, but the place is soulless because they're not going back to what they used to go to. And we have to social distance and I can't have lunch with the people who I used to have lunch with. And so it's, it's not the same as going to the office. And it's interesting when um, I think Kathleen, uh, you were speaking about the culture piece as well, that tied into all our connection with an organization is that culture it's we go to the office yes we have to do a job but there's um, a whole lot of other reasons why we go to the office you know and and that at the moment has been stripped out in the in the safe you know protected environment that has to be created at the moment um, and it's interesting as well because as you were talking there Nicole about that blended approach going forward. Again, some of the, the things that we're hearing from clients and our clients would spread, you know, the, the broad spectrum of global corporates to public sector, national companies and that. And some of them are thinking, oh gosh, this could be a great opportunity to make savings on, on the workspace, you know, because everyone seems happy working at home. But yet when we get behind some of the, the staff surveys they're doing, the staff are saying, well, yeah, we do like the fact that we can work from home because before you told us we couldn't, uh, but actually we also do want to be able to go back into the office. So I think one of the big challenges for uh, organizations as they muddle through the policy or the, the, the guideline around this is not creating policies or guidelines in the way they have done in the past, but just bring in a new lens to it, I think. Yeah. So, so then when we, when we pick up on uh, Nicole's um, thread of, of the future of work, um, what do you think that's going to look like, Kathleen H.? 
Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> if I had the answer, I could, <laughs> I could be making the big bucks. No, I, I, I do. I do believe that, you know, uh, co-creation with the, the, the staff is going to be key. And I believe that it is at a pivotal moment for some organizations to really rethink the relationship uh, that they have, you know, with the employee and the idea of um, the employee, you know, being able to have have a flexible day around which they organize getting their work done, uh, you know, being able to work from home some days, work in the office. Um, and there's some interesting research has been done out there around um, employees having access to flexible work practices. And a particular study that was done back in, I think it's about 2017, was looking at the impact of uh, access to flexible work practices on employee engagement, commitment, and uh, performance. And, you know, they were finding positive correlations between these. But very interestingly, they found a noted difference between those flexible work arrangements that were formal versus those that were informal. So informal being that the organization says, you know, if, if it suits you to work from home, I'm absolutely fine with that, so long as you get the work done. And we'll just agree that we need to have, you know, team meetings on a certain day or whatever. And, and what that was doing, their research was shown, was really positively impacting trust. Uh, you know, because employees were feeling empowered and trusted to make that, that, that arrangement work, where interestingly, the formal arrangements were having a negative impact on that, because possibly people have to go through some process of approval to get a formal arrangement, and then they feel it's an entitlement, and now that it's an entitlement, the company owe me something, and, and you lose that sort of give and take piece you know so there, there's some interesting pieces out there that i think can really help form some of the, the policy and guidelines that organizations create as they consider the future of work yeah i <clears throat> this is going to tap more into the second series we're doing when we talk about motivation and team performance and how we're measuring it um but what, what, um, what I'm finding a bit concerning is that many CEOs are saying people need to come back because without people in the offices, no work will happen. You know, and, and that sort of communication out there is I'm wondering whether it sends the right message, um, whether they are actually, um, whether it fits with their culture or whether that's a sign of trust. Um, it's almost like, OK, if I can't see you, I can't manage you. And I'm finding that a very unsettling message. So um, listening to um, what you were saying at DHL and Bacardi, that you consciously are taking a step in the other direction. And um, that will be interesting to see how that's going to pan out. Um, are you building in periods of review or how are you measuring this? Um, well, actually reverse COVID, you're putting people now back in the office. How, how are you going to measure this? What is, what is, um, how are you going to say this is successful? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, we haven't had formal review periods, but we obviously have frequent conversations and touch bases. And um, it, I, I was, as I was listening to Kathleen talk, you know, it reminded me when I did go in to clean out my office, I came across an article from 2019, so pre-COVID, talking about the new generations coming into the work force and how they were going to change remote work. They were going to make yeah. it, you know, become part of the future. And, and honestly, I think just COVID accelerated that. And then you look at the tech giants, right? The Facebooks, the Googles of the world who have said, go ahead, live anywhere. We, we trust you. Go, go to Timbuktu and you can do your job from there. And I think um, that's part of the strategy is embracing that, right? You have to embrace that. There obviously are activities that we need to do together. Um, and starting to learn and communicate what we think those are from a purposeful standpoint, right? When we have our performance review conversations, obviously they're best in person. Um, you know, if you can do, if you, if you need to do it, you know, through Zoom or whatever that might be, that's okay too. But, you know, maybe it's, it's about strategy conversations that you want to collaborate and whiteboard together. And, you know, having those deliberate 
and intentional times that you come together and then being flexible to everybody else who wants to be trusted and empowered to do their job, I think it's going to really, I know it gets to the next conversation, it is going to motivate people and it's a talent strategy. If you want to attract the best talent, you're going to have to kind of adapt and, and flex in this new world. So, yeah. along, <clears throat> along the way with that, I'm wondering if you're finding that uh, managers and leaders are delegating more strategic authority so that people can make more decisions uh, that things that used to be ha have to be run through the next level up, which is really one of the goals of uh, collaborative leadership is developing people so that they can do that. Are you finding that happening? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it's interesting you say that we, in our engagement surveys in the past, and we have struggled with agility, which would suggest mm. we have too many layers of management for decision making, right? Yeah. And so COVID put us to the test. And it was amazing to see how fast we got and how um, another one of our pillars besides family is also um, is, is being entrepreneurs, it's being founders. And so, you know, letting others bring ideas forward. And I think also with this new calendar management of everybody being so busy, you, leaders were having to learn how to delegate out better and not get, not be the, the kind of funnel and, um, you know, where you get in the way of things. So. Yes. Uh, I think, you know, I, I think everybody's learning as we go. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody has all the answers. I think we all could attest to that. Um, and it's why change agility becomes so critical um, in terms of like sourcing talent and making sure that people can, can adapt to change and deal with ambiguity. We talk about that all the time. So, mm. yeah. so when, when I'm listening to this conversation, it's, it sounds like the saying, I don't know if I'm getting this right, but the train has left the station. You know, we, we can't stop it anymore. It's happening. And um, <clears throat> what, what I wonder is whether we need some fresh and new CEOs who can lead that new train. Um, but that could be a conversation for next time. Um, I'm mindful of our time. So to um, round this up, I would like each of, to ask each of you um, if there is one strategy excuse me, if there's one strategy, one advice that you could leave the audience with, what would that be? For me, I look at it and say, you know, looking forward, it's, you have to listen to your employees, right? You have to listen to your employees. There is no one thing I can tell you. What has worked for us so far has been listening to our employees, listening to our customers. That has also helped us. I mean, I'm a, we're a commercial organization. So our touch point is face-to-face -face meetings with customers. But our customers, yeah. you know, wings, for lack of a better word, have also been clipped. So it has been resilience and the, the word of the day seems to be pivoting, but it's the, the, constant, um, the constant thing that we've had is change. And so it's been the resilience and, and the ability to adapt to change. But that's only going to be done by... Um, listening to what your employees and customers have to say. So you keep those open lines of communication open and you see what's working. When it's not working, you change. So mm -hmm. that's what I would say. It's, it's resilience. You know, you put the trust in your employees. They always, they, they always shine. So Thank you. Kathleen H. Yeah, uh, mine would be don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, so, so what do I mean by that? That, uh, you know, we, we worked in one particular way. Now we found another way of working. Let's go with that. But I, I think very much to Nicole's point in engaging with uh, the, the, the staff, the employees, the, the primos um, to, to help them co-create you know, what the new world looks like, but also think about those things that may not be obvious. And one of the big things that we're certainly concerned about is, is the loss of what we're calling ambient learning. So all that, so with new people coming into an organization and particularly early career, one of the most significant ways that we learn, whether we know it or not, is just by being around those great role models and, and people who, who do the jobs that we ultimately aspire to. And we learn a huge amount that way. And when we're not in and mixing around people, definitely we're losing, you know, a big piece that way. So, yeah. Yeah. Kathleen. You know, I, I, 
a lot of what Nicole and Kathleen have said like completely resonates. I think that the theme that comes through for me, whether it's in life or in business, is this ability to be open, right? This, every, this whole um, situation just put everything on its head and um, being open and flexible. The more that you're able to flex in whatever that is, you know, it's going to allow you to get on the train or just continue to move things forward. John, and you want to add to this? What yeah, is your been, one piece? <clears throat> thank you. I've been thinking uh, about that a lot. And um, I'd like to share the piece of advice that my executive coach gave me when I was the chief operations officer of a healthcare company. And he was very frustrated with me because I'm kind of a, an abrasive, I know what I'm doing, New Yorker. And he basically said to me, listen, um, you're going to do one thing. And I said, what's that? He said, Be before you tell anybody what to do, they get to tell you why it won't work. And, I, I, and he said, you're going to tell the, the garbage man how to pick up the garbage differently. The garbage man gets to tell you why it won't work. You're going to tell the receptionist to answer the phone dif differently. The f receptionist gets to tell you why it won't work. And then he said, and two things are going to happen if you don't do that. One of them is uh, I'm going to quit. And the other one is you're going to get beaten up. And I didn't believe that because he was a friend, but I started doing it. And uh, for senior executives, I would just sincerely recommend asking people, what am I missing? Why won't it work? Yeah. yeah. And, and to add to that is, and what would work? Right, right. I want to put it back in their shoes and invite their input because, yes. I mean, they're after all um, the people of the organization who are making it run. Yeah. And... Um, and ask, you know, challenge their minds. What, what, what does work? What would work? Sure. Um, I'm, I'm finding for overwhelmed leaders doing exactly what you just said. Yeah. Before making a decision, send it out to your team and have them tell you how they would solve it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, um, <clears throat> thank you so much. We have to um, wind this conversation up. Um, I'm really, really thrilled to say that um, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you all. And um, yeah, to, to some extent, looking at the future, we're really only scratching the surface. DHL is, you know, looking at it now moving forward. Bacardi is launching as of next week. So there's different levels of organizations moving at different spaces and paces. And uh, it'd be interesting to see. So really good luck to you all. And... Uh, Stay tuned for our second episode where we're going to talk about when we move this forward, how we're actually managing, measuring and motivating our people. Thanks again for participating, for jumping in today. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation and um, well, see you in a week or two. Great. Thank Thanks you. Been great. Good to see you guys. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.